Welcome to Mound Bayou, Mississippi. One of the first all black incorporated towns in the United States. Founded in 1887 by two former slaves, Isaiah T. Montgomery and his cousin, Benjamin T. Green. Mound Bayou flourished through the years. It had a railroad station where the colored waiting area was larger than the white waiting area. A hospital, several churches, schools, a bank, a telephone line, and numerous black owned business. It was a proud and powerful community and it was considered a safe haven for blacks. A refuge in the area of white controlled cotton plantations and racial violence where a black man could run for sheriff instead of running from the sheriff. Around the 1900s, it was deemed by President Theodore Roosevelt as the jewel of the Delta. But there came a time in 1939 when friction developed in Mound Bayou. The murder of one of their own in front of his store sparked a frenzy of shock. The residents didn't know what was becoming of their beloved town. Mound Bayou had been virtually crime free. Now, conflict became a part of its existence. The discord and hostility robbed the local residents of the security they had worked so hard for and by the 1960s it was evident that pride, power and security no longer applied to Mound Bayou. On July 15, 1965, the ugliness from which Mound Bayou tried to hide, from which it tried to escape by being self-governed, was interrupted once again by a force of violence from a posse of white men that brought the spirit of the town's people to their knees. Willie Wilson Jr., a 21-year-old convict who had returned home to Mound Bayou 12 days earlier, was sought for taking the officer's gun on the road outside of Mound Bayou. I'm from Mound Bayou, and so the police was put up, put up behind them and trying to, you know, get them stopped. And so they kept driving, so the police shot through the back window, I think, stop. So he, he stopped, and so he got out, and he did, so my little brother, he said, you still don't move. While the officer attempted to arrest Willie for the death of several cars, Willie overcame him. He attempted to do that and turn around, hit the police, and knocked him out. So he left. Willie was determined not to go back to jail. So once he overcame the officer, he took his gun, and he did attempt to shoot him, but the gun jammed. So Willie then fled on foot back to his grandmother's house in Mount Bayou. There, he pleaded for help to get out of town. Shortly later, he disappeared into the night. He found refuge under the house where his brother stayed with the friend. My mama, he said, I got in trouble. He said, I got to go. He said, I got to get out of town. And so he changed clothes that night and he left. He left. And that's when he went hid on um, Mr. Frank's house. It wasn't long before a posse of 100 men gathered from surrounding counties to search for Willie Woodson. They converged on Mount Bayou with a vengeance. People's homes were searched. Clubs Willie frequented were searched. Roadblocks set up. Cars stopped. The residents forced to open trunks and lie on the ground along the roads. When they complained to their mayor and police department about allowing such clan-like activity from outside white forces, it fell on deaf ears. The town, though all black, could not fight against the white attackers. Willie's mother, Millie Woodson, was picked up, taken for a ride, cussed at, and slapped to the point of knocking her teeth out. And they took her for a ride. And what happened? They slapped her, knocked her teeth out. Willie's grandmother, Ann McGee, had her humble wooden frame house tossed about and searched. Her papers were thrown out on the stairs, the same stairs she had mopped an hour earlier to bleach to hide the scent of her grandson from the dog. They tried to make a tent to us, he did not go nowhere. They kept watching the house. We were like South Africa on the sea because of the fact that they were harassing people. Had like the invasion of the old black town lasted through the night and spilled into the next day while Willie's mother frantically searched for help to get her son out of town. She enlisted the help of Mr. Andrew Moore from the NAACP, but it was too late. And so, you know, nobody know he running there until um, the next morning, my brother, one of my brother's friends, happened to came on the back porch. And then, you know, 
you heard my brother came, he said, PJ. And so she said, come on in. She was telling him that he said, man, I just got in trouble with the law. He said, I got to get away from here. And um, he said, he said, I'm not going back to jail. He said, they would have to kill me before I go back to jail. So clown, he fed him that morning, so he went back on the house. He said, by 3 o'clock, he said, wake me up. I'm going to try to get away. They found Willie around 3 o'clock that afternoon under a shotgun house where he waited for help and food. Beside him lay the carbine rifle and the 357 he had taken from the officer. Inside was his brother's friend. Willie was told to come out, at which time gunshots rang out. Going out, nigga. Five bullets ripped through Trooper Marcus Lamasta's chest. 151 more entered Willie Woodson. Numerous others peppered the house and the surrounding area. Once the barrage of bullets stopped, Willie Woodson was pulled from beneath the house. Some say he was beaten with nightsticks. Others don't remember the fine details, but they do remember the police removing Willie's body and leaving his brains and intestines sprawled on the ground. A local resident buried those remains. Trooper Marcus Lamastis, not far away, lay bleeding. His superiors denied him to be seen at Mount Bayo's hospital there in town. He was later taken to Cleveland, where he died. Willie Woodson's rotor body was placed on display at the town's funeral home. Many of the residents came to see him. Never had they witnessed anything so gruesome. This is how they remember it. They had a Tommy gun, dogs, helicopters, they were frisking people for a whole week. And uh, it was just, it was just disheartening. Yeah. And next thing I heard, they had shot him up so bad that it, um, Tom Marr was, and he couldn't recognize his feet from his head. So they had to bury him, a lot of his body right there on the spot. Yeah. And I thought that was absurd because of the way they did it, regardless of who was the mayor of the police force. I didn't think they should have come into town to do that. And the young, the man that died, he may have lived, he, he shot one of the police, and he died. We had a hospital here. They refused to take the police to the hospital here, so we went to Cleveland, on the route to Cleveland, the man died. And I heard last year that the wife of the man had two daughters. Mm -hmm. That she was saying how hard work it was some 30 years ago that her husband was lost, and she had two children to raise, and uh, fatherless. And at the same time, I was thinking, I said, how did the, no one ever mention about the other family that lost? They asked the people in Cleveland uh, to bury him. And they said, uh, and the little one, they said, you know, they said the family didn't have any uh, burial insurance. And so anyway, they said, well, we'll send a casket up since we, you know, killed him. And so they sent him a small box up. And then my aunt, who was in Bronx, there was in Mauritius, she said, his body had so many little bullet holes in it that it couldn't hold a bombing through it. They just had to put him in a body bag and take him to the cemetery the next day. The, the, the incident started in Mount Bow. It went on up there to, uh, up there, up there, at a little church, Pilgrim Rest, I believe, and that's where, that's where he met came in contact with the patrol. And of course, uh, somehow or another, he got hands on the patrolman and and I think he fired a shot. Or there was a shot fired. But anyway, he got away and got out here. And he was located under the house, under a little shotgun house over there in Banks Edition. Afternoon, about 34 years ago. Still, I say, well, prayer still left, but yet um, it still left a scar. And this <coughs> shot more people than in the middle <coughs> Because right here in this town, because we have a separate telephone line, which was not, it was a private line, it was not a public line. 
because they wouldn't put a phone in at that time. And this man, Dr. Howard, made the one call to J. Edgar Hoover in Washington, D.C. to tell that in Selma, Mississippi, they had taken this 12-year-old boy, uh, this young child, in a till and had um, mutilated. Yeah, mutilated and killed him. And they said because of that one phone call that came out of Mount Zion, that's when they hit the Jet Magazine, everything and the whole world knew about the case that happened in Mississippi at that time. And then after that, when this happened in our own city years later, it left like a big scar, uh, uh, awesome, with, with the people's spirit, that it really went back and reflected on a lot of information. And so like I said, the family never got biblical counseling, psychological counseling. No closure? No, no closure, nothing. They were just left on their own, just care of God in order to help them to survive through all these years. And he just, he didn't have any top part of his head at all. I looked at him on a stretcher over there and I'm taking a shot. And uh, it was the most gruesome sight. And what I, what they did, they went and got his mother to bring her over there. His mother was living there at that time. And when she walked in there and looked at her child, she fainted right there when she fainted ice out the door and I'd never go back in anymore. And I thought they just ought to just not present her. I know she would want to see it, but it was the most gruesome sight. I, I don't know how many times, yeah. uh, but the house and the walls where he was under the house was just peppered with bullet holes. And I walked around on the, it, I understand he was under the house in the cottage today. And that also bent down to look up under the house to see. And that's when he looked up under, he shot that officer. And when he shot that officer, he was just surrounded by officers everywhere. They just cut loose on that house, the walls, the top, the underneath there, and him under there, everything. And when, he, when they pulled him out of that, under, from under that house, I, I don't know what they pulled out, but they, they brought his body up there in the undertaker and they had it stretched out on a little cart out there and they had some things spread it over but I just looked it didn't look like it was a human being. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. That true shit, true shit, true shit. That shit that make you feel shit, feel shit. The horrific hunting down and gunning down of Willie Woodson Jr. on July 15, 1965 will always be etched in the minds of the citizens of Mount Bayou, Mississippi. A constant reminder that racial violence could come at any given time. That the little town store might have to feed many more on the run from the law. That many more mothers and grandmothers would wash down stairs. That another white officer might get shot. Another Willie Woodson die even in a self-governed all-black town, just like it did once in Mount Bayou. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. That true shit, true shit, true shit. That shit that make you feel shit, feel shit. Feel shit.